members in photolithography, um, investigating the undercut angle of um, photolithography patterns and trying to see what parameters uh, affected the angle of the undercut. Unfortunately, about three weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, um, I was informed by my employer that I was no longer allowed to present my presentation here. Um, they said that it was proprietary information and it had to get approved and it hasn't gotten approved in time. So, unfortunately, uh, so, uh, sorry. So, uh, <laughs> So since I can't talk about this project that I worked on, um, I did do further work with uh, Dr. Qualls last year, so instead I'll be going over that. Um, I worked on a liquid armor system using oil shear thickening fluid um, to increase the ballistic characteristics of Kevlar. Uh, so here's a quick little outline. So I'm going to go over why it's important, uh, or why, why is what I did significant. What is a shear thickening fluid? Um, a quick introduction to Kevlar. Uh, the processing I did, the results that I gathered, and, and acknowledgements. So why is this important? So liquid armor, um, it's a new technology. It came out probably about six years ago. Uh, it's, re it's a really like, versatile platform. Uh, it's used a lot right now as uh, motorcycle protective gear for riders, um, but it does have uh, further applications in military and uh, police body armor. But unfortunately, uh, due to bureaucratic situations, it's not currently being used. Um, and liquid armor has been proven uh, by multiple agencies to be uh, a better protector for a ballistic impact than just a typical Kevlar vest, which uses solely Kevlar and uh, ballistic nylon. Uh, so what is a shear thickening fluid? Uh, shear thickening fluid is a dilatant fluid. It's basically a fluid that whenever it is under uh, a high shear rate or it's under stress, it will solidify. And then once it's not under stress anymore, it goes back into a liquid flowing form. Um, so its viscosity will increase with the shear strain. And that follows this equation um, here, the power law equation, where the viscosity will increase if uh, that end value is greater than two. And I believe that's a, uh, or it's just some kind of a correlative effect between, or in this equation, I'm not exactly sure how it works, but. Um, shear thickening is a reversible process, however, so after it does get solidified by the ballistic impact, it will go back to the fluid, so it will remain <coughs> flexible even after impact. Uh, so this is just kind of a quick little diagram of what's happening in a shear thickening fluid. So as you can see, the green particles, um, those would be like, uh, in my case, it would be silicon and polyethylene glycol. And whenever a shear stress is introduced, these particles will clump together and will basically form these bands. And um, this just provides the structure to the, to the liquid to make it solid, um, which is good for ballistic impact. It'll absorb more, dam or absorb more energy and it will uh, prevent penetration. So just real quick, Kevlar, it's a uh, fabric made of uh, woven polyaramid fibers. Um, it's a really tight weave. They use it a lot in body armor, and uh, uh, they use it in bulletproof helmets and stuff like that. Uh, traditionally, it's used in many layers, and that's how they get their effect. They use uh, around 20 or so layers of woven Kevlar, followed by some uh, additional layers of unwoven Kevlar and ballistic nylon. Uh, this is just you know, a standard bulletproof vest here, and this is uh, basically a cross section of that vest. And you can see that there's multiple layers of Kevlar, which are needed to uh, protect from ballistic impact. And here's a SEM image of Kevlar. So you can see it's a really tight weave. This is a uh, it's a one millimeter scale. So it's really tightly woven. It's really good at protecting when it does, but it can protect from higher velocity rounds or higher mass round uh, projectiles. So I did, uh, whenever I was working with it, I was working with small samples of Kevlar. Um, I would use a coil suspension of silica and polyethylene glycol, and I mixed it together with some ethanol to facilitate the impregnation of the silica particles into the fibers of the Kevlar. And I would just allow it to soak overnight in this uh, shear thickening 
mixture. Um, after that, the, after the Kevlar was saturated, we baked it in the oven to uh, evaporate the ethanol. And that was mostly just to uh, do the imaging. You wouldn't necessarily do that if you were doing it for actual armor production. Um, and then after they were dried, we cut them into smaller squares so they would fit onto the SEM uh, chuck. And we used, it to, we used SEM to capture the mag or magnified images of the samples. So this is a, a sample of Kevlar that was impregnated with two milliliters of shear thickening fluid. This is at the one millimeter scale. You can see that there's the crystal formation on the surface of the Kevlar. Um, and this is probably a good thing. No, we're not 100% sure about exactly the ramifications of this. Uh, this is at 120x, and in this corner, uh, it's kind of hard to see with the projector, but you can see that there are um, some silica part particles that are actually uh, like coating the fibers. And I believe that this is a good sign that this is a, a practical application, or like that the treatment process that I used was practical and worked appropriately. Um, you can see here some more of the, of the fibers that are coated with these silica, uh, silica particles. And then this, also this plating, this platelet kind of structure that's on, that's on there. Again, I believe this is a good sign um, that what I did worked. Uh, this is an EDX image, um, which shows the elemental composition of the Kevlar after treatment. You can see that there is a lot of silica, which you would expect since it's a silica-based uh, coil suspension, and then also a lot of carbon and oxygen, which is what uh, polyethylene glycol is made of, as well as Kevlar. Um, you see, there's a high amount of silicon here, uh, and again, this is this is uh, with only the silicon composited in to the, to the sample picture. <coughs> so, like I said, I believe that I succeeded in um, properly treating the Kevlar for its protection or for uh, its purposes that we were doing it anyway. Um, so this is just kind of a quick little review of how ballistic protection is uh, basically quantified. Uh, armor is rated based on a protection level. Um, that's this or it's determined by the government. And they use a V50 test, which is they take a projectile of known mass and then they fire it at 50% of what the velocity would be if it were coming out of a handgun or some other uh, projectile launcher. And they basically, they take a lot of measurements, they use this, they use these two equations to determine um, how effective the armor is at stopping a projectile and how much energy it absorbs and things like that. But unfortunately, we probably couldn't have gotten clearance to do any type of high velocity ballistic test or high mass ballistic test. So instead, we used a BB gun. <laughs> <laughs> So we set up this, uh, this testing rig. Uh, we have the BB gun here, um, a 50 Newton force sensor, and then we just kind of put two optics holders together and use that as a sample holder for the Kevlar um, that had been treated, that had been fully treated with the, uh, with the shear thickening fluid. So it was actually uh, a fluid sample with a Kevlar in it. Um, unfortunately, the results were really varied when we did the testing, um, a lot of our, we had issues with measuring the, the force that was being absorbed. Um, you know, one, one test we did just a single layer of Kevlar and it actually absorbed less, uh, or absorbed more force than the, uh, than a sample that had like 10 layers of Kevlar. So it was just kind of really sporadic in getting actual results. Um, I don't know, if, or we also peaked out the, the meter a lot, so I'm not sure if we just needed a, a better meter to um, measure this force that was absorbed. And also, Kevlar really isn't designed for low projectile, or low velocity projectiles. Um, you can actually really easily cut through a Kevlar vest. So, I don't know if BB gun, or if a BB was a proper uh, tool to use for this testing. And you can see here, this is, uh, this was a graph that I did. This was, I believe, 24 layers of Kevlar. And you can see that it just peaked out the meter. Uh, so we didn't get any real uh, valuable data from, the, uh, from our measurements. So just conclusions um, that I came to. Uh, I found that I 
what I believe I thoroughly impregnated the Kevlar with the shear thickening fluid. Um, I believe that the technique that I used was correct, that if uh, somebody else wanted to come along, they could reuse my techniques and replicate uh, the same samples, and possibly if somebody can get permission, do actual uh, high velocity ballistic tests, um, which we need for proper testing of the material. And I also think that it would be valuable to test other um, possible shear thickening fluids. There's a number of different dilating materials, uh, cornstarch, cornstarch and water, um, silly putty, and we're also thinking of mixing instead of silicon using aluminum absorption um, in the, in the propylene or polyethylene glycol or uh, diatomaceous earth just to make it cheaper and uh, bring down the cost. So again, future work that would be investigating these different materials in, uh, into a colloidal suspension and seeing how they work compared to silicon. Um, looking into the effect of shear thinking fluid with different uh, woven materials, such as just ballistic ni nylon, which is a lower grade of Kevlar. And also there's another one called Dyneema, which is a new form of, it's a new better form of Kevlar, essentially. And finally actually collects um, some high velocity ballistic tests on the sample materials. So I'd like to thank Dr. Pauls for helping me out the past couple of years, doing uh, working on my projects and supporting everything that I've decided to do. Uh, I'd like to thank the Franklin County Sheriff's Office for donating a uh, number of Kevlar um, body armor protection pads that they were no longer using, so I could use them, cut them up, and make my samples. I'd like to thank Steve Anderson for helping setting up the uh, the testing rig and providing the BB gun and everything like that and just helping out with SEM and EDX work and pretty much everything he does. And also I'd like to thank the department just for having me being cool. <laughs> so. To my knowledge, uh, Kevlar Vest only can take one shot because then the fibers will be torn. Yeah. Uh, but using this, we'll be able to take more rounds and higher caliber bullets. It's possible. Um, there's been, like I've seen some studies where they're talking about using self-healing plastics. Um, because the, the Kevlar, whenever it's impregnated with the fluid, it has to be encased in some kind of plastic because it's wet. Um, and there's been talk of using self-healing plastics that can reform over and actually, like, keep the integrity of the test, uh, of the best. But um, with just, even just the plastic sleeping around it, I mean, some of the liquid will uh, seep out, but it's not like really like in like a bath of the solution. It's more so just kind of like a damp cloth. So really it will still keep its integrity, um, perhaps not in the same like area as the ballistic impact that's occurred, but like elsewhere around the best it would still work. Yeah. Is there a big weight differential between treated Kevlar and non-treated Kevlar with this? Yeah, so um, they or in a study that I read, they found that with, um, I believe, 10 layers of Kevlar, they could use, uh, or the, or, sorry, um, compared to 10 layers of Kevlar, they only had to use five layers of Kevlar um, that were soaked in the shear thickening fluid. And so that makes it thinner and more flexible. However, because you have the added weight of the fluid, it ends up being the same weight as 10 layers of Kevlar. So it doesn't really make anything lighter, but it does allow for applications for um, like sleeves and pant legs and shoes and things like that that typically you wouldn't be able to do because it would be too rigid. So there are a lot of applications for liquid armor systems um, that are being developed now. There's, like I said, not being currently used by it, or for any actual ballistic protection. Yeah. Does the coating uh, degrade naturally over time? Does it pretty much stay with the armor? Um, I'm not sure. As far as I know, it doesn't. Um, I, I can't really answer that. I didn't look into it. Sorry. Yes.